What's up, everybody? It's your boy Mars Man here, and welcome to Mars Man Gaming. In this video, we break down the biggest gaming news topics of the week. And as always, I need the Mars Man crew along with me. So, first to my left is Langella Kill. What's up, everybody? And to my right is Haki. What's going on, guys? So, as always, every time we start a video, I try to explain that this is a ever growing uh basically series that we try to film a certain day of the week and if we can't get to every news topic that happens we'll just cover it in the next week and we kind of took a week off due to the fact that we're all on vacation so we have some big news topics that actually did happen this week that we definitely wanted to discuss and let's just jump right into it the biggest thing that happened this week was the i guess you would say the leaked information that came about in the i guess you would say the case battle that was going on between um, a lot of other gaming development companies against the acquisition of Activision and Blizzard going for Microsoft. So essentially what happened was uh, most of the time in these courts, a lot of the different arguments that are put into place are kind of kept under wraps. They're not really shown to the public. However, in Brazil, they actually open up all the information so that everybody can see it. So basically all the different arguments made from both Microsoft's point of view, as well as Sony, as well as other companies, not just Sony's, but everybody that is against this acquisition. Um, basically, all their arguments were now put on the table. So so essentially what happened was Sony was found saying that uh, they are against the purchase of Activision Blizzard due to the fact that Call of Duty is a massive scale IP that if Microsoft were to purchase this IP and control it, essentially they would have complete control or not complete control, but major influence over the fact that most of the Call of Duty players that are currently playing that series are around 78% of them are Sony console owners. So if they control Call of Duty, they can essentially make it completely exclusive and that would have a direct impact on who or what game console they buy in the future and which means that it would impact sony's bottom dollar and this is one of the arguments that they had put forward uh stating that the xbox were to gain complete control uh this is a translation uh it would then would directly impact consumer choice of console this is a quote stated from that article now obviously call of duty is a massive ip we know it's a massive franchise now granted we have a lot of there's a lot of negative things you can say about call of duty and it's not saying it's perfect in any way shape or form but it's massive it's always a top five selling game of the year even when it's hot garbage and um essentially when you look at the other point of view microsoft was i mean they're, they're making bs claims saying that activision doesn't really have any major ip that will make any impact here um which we all know is false from that point but it's obviously it's an argument in court now basically from that quote that the sony quote i just read to you every content creator out there was going out saying sony is afraid of xbox and i kind of want to get your all opinions because i didn't want to make an entire video solely on this question because everybody was jumping on the bandwagon to do that i kind of want to let us discuss that so i want to kind of get your opinion do you think that the case that sony's making means that they are a, that they're scared of xbox and the acquisition here so i'll let langella kill go first because we had a lot of discussions about this acquisition i want to let you talk about it first langella what do you think are is sony scared of xbox no i i don't think that they're scared of xbox but what they are doing is trying to um and i think they will unsuccessfully try to kill a deal because one of its uh largest ips for a gun game is on the line and that's call of duty and they don't want xbox to control that ip for obvious reason you mentioned the stat before as in there's a heavy dosage of uh playstation players um that play call of duty so keeping it as a third party is beneficial for sony um more so than xbox getting the reins and now again there is a contract that sony has with activision and with all things that have been discussed microsoft has told everybody um and i believe they will abide by the contract but the contract again is only a couple of years left on that i think it's in 24 that it i think 2024 yeah i think yeah. is when and after 2024 that's where that's why this is where the fight's happening right it's it's for 2024 um and it's trying to kill a deal that they know that microsoft once 24 ends they have a lot of leverage on what it goes next for call of duty and so i think again it's it's court talk about you know trying to win their case and that's why sony is making their case that you know call of duty and there are is there is statistics to it even though i think that 
Call of Duty is a real shell of itself, but they are a top five selling gun gun game IP, and it's very large market on Sony. Um, and you know, people kept hammering about the line that Sony used um, as a you know weak, making them look weak. But you know, Xbox they gave their own BS, like you stated as well too. That hey, you know, Activision doesn't have any IPs that anybody should be worried about uh, being exclusive. Like we know that's BS too. It's just there's just a lot of lawyer talking going back and forth to try to win their side. So again, I, I don't think it's a fear thing. I think it is a tough blow um, for Sony um, because what it's going to do is going to force their hand if they lose, and I think they eventually will lose. And I think when 24 comes around, there will be some. I know there's a big disagreement with what I'm about to say. I do think there will be some exclusive rights that microsoft is going to take privilege with call of duty whether it's a couple months that it's exclusive or a month it's going to start off in my opinion on xbox and then jump to sony consoles i do think it'll stay multi-platform but there will be some exclusive rights whether that's a warzone concept or whether the online starts a month early on xbox game pass something and that's what sony does not want they do not want that exclusive rights going to xbox so i don't think it's a fear thing i think it's a strategic thing and you know this is how it works in a courtroom so i don't really understand the con the the everyone's mind being blown by what sony said yeah so uh hockey what do you think man do you think that sony is scared of xbox in this acquisition yes i think uh langella kill made a lot of good points um i wouldn't say they're scared i think they're more threatened um of what you know can happen if uh, now, I didn't know anything about the contract that ends in 2024, but once it ends in 2024, like Langella Kill said, there could be some, you know, exclusive rights that they can uh, give to Xbox owners, you know, so I don't think they're scared. I think they have enough IPs themselves to stay afloat. That's why, you know, I'm going to take a look at the uh, PS4 and then start playing some real good games, but uh, I wouldn't say they're scared. I, I say they're threatened. Um, and yeah, people that are saying that Activision doesn't have uh, good IP uh, IPs, isn't Activision also Blizzard as well? It's like Activision. yeah, it's both. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's Microsoft. It's Microsoft yeah. saying that in court. So like Sony saying this, Microsoft saying, they're just it's lawyer talk. Like Microsoft doesn't I, I, believe I, that. I guess I guess if you're looking specifically at if you're saying like Activision, because Activision they don't really use any other of their IPs other than Call of Duty, right? I mean, I think if you're saying other than Call of Duty. There's no IPs on Activision that know, are as worth it. I think, same. and I'm just saying, you know like, I mean? if you're like saying, if you talk, well, because here's the thing: talk. as much as Call of Duty is the biggest one, if they're saying other than Call of Duty, there's no IPs that are matching the level of what Call of Duty is. And I think if you're making that case, it, I guess it makes sense because even if the Diablo, Diablo Immortal, like by all means, most people despise it because it's a mobile game that's just hemorrhaging money by stealing, by basically stealing it people's wallets but it's not like a grand and that's a mobile game i'm just saying like there's no like Dia diablo older games are great but no recent diablo game has matched the level of you know like the, the call of duty level now i if they're just saying no game on activision is this level that's bs but if they're saying other than call of duty there's nothing like to this degree i'm not gonna like i can disagree to some things i can agree to some things but like call of duty itself is its own beast like that's like its own top tier if as much as everyone will rag on cold duty it's a top five selling game every year no matter what vanguard was a top five selling game of the year right even if it sucked ass like it's still top five right but older like the other ones yeah like, there's a lot of ips that activision and blizzard own that you if you do the right thing and you bring in people to make games for it then you can't make that case like they have some classics under their their realm that you can that you can take and do something with it, but they those companies themselves haven't haven't done anything. So I do agree that I, that is kind of BS to say that there's nothing, but it also depends on what if they're saying that yeah, other than Call of Duty, there's no game that matches Call of Duty's level because that's true. That is true. There's no game in that that they own that is Call of Duty level. But like I said, it really depends on what specifically they're saying. But yeah, it's just lawyer talk, right? They're just trying to make the case to prove their point. Um. But so hockey, would you anything else you say for that? Or I was just gonna bring in Overwatch, like Activision Blizzard, Overwatch, or like I'm a big Overwatch fan. So like if they were to make if they were to make Overwatch and Call of Duty exclusive at some point, I think that would be, you know, a heavy blow to you know, PlayStation. Yeah, well here's the thing. So if I'm looking at it from do I think Sony is scared of Xbox? No. What I do think 
what this does, and I agree with both of you here, is that this makes it makes them threatened and it makes them have to spend more money to now create their own FPS, right? They haven't had an FPS gain in more than a decade, like a good one, like SOCOM. Everyone keeps slamming the table that SOCOM is the best. SOCOM 2, Navy SEALs, was the best SOCOM game that matched Halo 3 levels, which, I'm sorry, is a hunk of BS, right? That came out in 2003, all right? 2003, that game came out. They haven't had a top level because by Metacritic standards, SOCOM 2 was an 87, right? That is the level of Halo Infinite. So if we're going to start saying that the best of the best of Sony's FPS, game, FPS games are, you know, we could just make FPS game that's Halo level. Yeah, you know what? SOCOM 2, the best one that was exclusive to Sony is Halo Infinite's level. Nothing ever matched that Halo 3, Halo 2, Halo 1 to Metacritic. So the whole point is this now forces Sony to have to take their money and resources that they could be funneling to their top tier story games and now have to invest that into a gun into a gun game, an FPS game that now means they have to take money elsewhere, right? Not saying that they can't do it. I, I'm not saying they can't do it. And don't I don't want to hear people saying, oh, Mars Band said that Sony can't make a shooter. No. Because I played shooters. Lamila and Joe Kill have played Sony shooters before. We played Mag, which I thought was fantastic. But they were way too overzealous for their time period, which, you know, if they made a PS5 version of Mag, it would be great. But it's not. They're right? not doing that. If they made a SOCOM game, yeah, you know what? For certain people, they're going to really love it. We played Resistance, right? Resistance was a great game, right? But they killed that franchise too. Killzone. Not really necessarily biggest fans of Killzone, but Killzone was a big gun game for them, and they killed that franchise. So these are all gun games that they created over the years, and now it means they'll have to either revive it or try to create a new one. And I think for them, they realize that this takes money and time. And I really, then they'd rather not have to do that because they were banking that Call of Duty would be their gun game going forward because clearly by the statistics, that's what it shows, right? And Microsoft, essentially, they are like, I guess you would say the kings of making just gun games because that's solely what they do. They don't have the most story-based games out there. They have a lot of just shooters, right? Shooter story games. That's why, like, when you look at the player percentage of who plays Call of Duty, you're always saying, like, how is it possible that Xbox is so low? It's because they have a funnel of a bunch of different gun games on their platform, and solely just means you don't have to go play Call of Duty, right? And that's essentially what it looks like. So I think they aren't scared. I think they just rather not have to spend the money and resources that now have to create a brand new franchise and hope it lands, because that's the thing. You can... So they've tried to make other games like uh, I think it's called Spite. I think that was one of the games that was like a Halo esque type of FPS shooter, and it failed miserably on Sony. And that was they a long they, time ago. But no, I'm saying they tried to make exclusives, right? And like I said, some of them were good, and then some of them weren't. So it's like you're gambling to see I, does I this FPS it. game good? I, I I wanted to interrupt because you know there's this all this talk about FPS shooters. Name me five great FPS shooters right now. Mm. There, do you? I don't. It's struggle to name five. There isn't a lot of great FPS shooters. Battlefield was a disaster. Call of Duty Vanguard, yeah, top five selling. But guess what? A lot of people don't like Call of Duty Vanguard. They're buying it out of just necessity for an FPS shooter. Yep. So there's opportunity there to create a shooter. There is an opportunity now. I know Sony brought Destiny, and that's trying to alleviate the blow of this because they're anticipating them losing. They don't buy Bungie to get Destiny if they don't think that this Call of Duty thing is gonna go is gonna drop. That's that's a result, and they I think they know that this is you know this is a last ditch effort to try to stop this deal, and it's not gonna happen. But no offense, guys, like a Battlefield was made, and Overwatch was made. Like these are these games have been made, and I think with the the state of FPS shooters, there is real opportunity to create an FPS shooter. There really is, because there's not that many good ones. Yes, Call of Duty is going to sell. That's always going to sell. But there is room to create FPS shooters. Yeah, there is room, but I'll just tell you, from track record alone, I they have recently, they have not been great ones. And I'm sorry. Have they even tried? That's the point. I, I, my only thing is, the last 10 they, years, well, they're going to pay more. But here's the thing. In the last right? 10 years, have they, has there even been effort? From, from what, Sony or just games in general? In games in general. Games I mean, general, like, I'm sure it's, I'm sure people have tried. I mean, but the whole thing is that it's just like, they just haven't been landing. Now, 
And in the past 10 years, you did have Apex, you did have like Fortnite, you did have, you know, like, you, like I, really I said, you did them have as FPS. They're more. Well, that's role. the thing. I think it's really about the flavor, the flavor that we're getting, right? The the flavor of the of the decade, and we said this on one of the previous videos, was open was was uh, battle royales, right? Yeah. So battle royale was the flavor of the decade. So I think that people are more content with going to go play a battle royale game than playing an FPS game. And it's, it shows because you'll have even like Halo Infinite, right? And as an example, Halo Infinite is, I generally, I think it's a solid game missing content, right? I think generally with people who are leaving Halo Infinite are either going one of few places, going back to MCC, right? Because they miss, they just want to see a game that has full of content and MCC has a crap ton of maps and stuff to do, right? You're going to Apex, which has on its, what, 14th season now, I think? Right there, and I don't necessarily think they're adding anything crazy that's changing the landscape. Fortnite, when all they did was basically took away, they have a game mode that takes away building, right? And and that all your that's all people are playing right now. So it's like they're not really jumping like in Vanguard. They just have a crew of people that are just playing Vanguard because they're just Call of Duty fanatics and they just want to stay playing yeah, some and quarter. It's the same thing with Duty. Destiny. I mean, Destiny is another one that yeah, that Destiny, Destiny. You're yeah. you're gonna get people still playing Overwatch. There are people going back to playing Battlefield Four or Battlefield One, and they're like, you know what I mean, like they're or not, Battlefield not, ba not Battlefield Five. Yeah, yeah, I'm saying Battlefield Five, right? They're <laughs> not playing 2042, but they're going to go play World War Two Battlefield instead. Yeah. So essentially, like, I don't disagree with you either, Angelica. But the but the my point of view here is Sony also realizes that they've struggled to make an FPS shooter. And as much as people want to say, well, Sony's amazing, and they are. They have some talented people that make their games. They've struggled to make an FPS that's landed in the past 15 years that has landed and consistently just been played because the Call of Duty giant has been taking up their entire franchise. Now, granted, I think when I the second question I was going to add on, we talked about it a lot already, but what the impact of this acquisition is, we kind of mentioned a lot of impact here. Now, and Angelico kind of made it at his point of saying, that Xbox would be stupid to not make it an exclusive they at would. some point in time. Now, the other point of view, and I'll say it, is that they would keep it multi-plat, but use it as a kind of bartering chip to say, either you give us some of those games like Final Fantasy to be multi-plat, or we're going to take away Call of Duty completely, or better yet, you can buy the full price $70 for your Call of Duty game and then we will keep it on Game Pass for a discounted rate. And they just came out with the family clan Game Pass idea. So that means more people will have Game Pass and access to Call of Duty on Xbox consoles rather than going to go pay it full price on the PlayStation. And I think partly the reason why I think it that way is because this acquisition is going to cost $68 billion, right? And Call of Duty being a top five selling game every year, if you kind of cut away the majority of people buying the game, you're going to lose out on a lot of that revenue that you could be getting, right? And I, that's the only reason why I, I keep talking about this concept was because you're losing revenue. And like even Destiny, Destiny, by all, what they're stating, won't be an exclusive because they're losing out on a lot of money that's going to you know PCs and Xboxes that are buying and playing Destiny at the moment. And their fear is if you take it away completely, how much of that revenue you're going to lose and how much longer will it take for you to get that money back? Right. And I think that's kind of the issue that people are, are having on, on whether or not this will be exclusive. I think, you know, I, I, and Lynn Jellicale, you can kind of you can jump in if you want. I want to give Hockey a chance to talk about this concept. Let Hockey of, go first. I so Hockey, what's what's, what's your what's your opinion about do you think that this is going to be a exclusive or do you think it's going to stay multi-plat and Xbox is going to just get money in for every purchase that it makes, essentially? Yeah, so I'm, I'm I, I think I have the idea kind of like Langella did say before, it was, uh, you know, knowing that the contract now is only going to be ending in 2024, they're most likely going to keep a multi-plat, you know, play nice for probably maybe a few years. And then I think your idea of the game pass would probably be good. They're trying to get game pass like on everything. Right. So maybe they do like Langella said, a war zone only on game pass or keep a multi-plat. So that, I mean, they have a lot of opportunity if it goes through um, there's a ton of opportunity for Xbox to kind of, Hold it as a bartering trip, as you know, as you mentioned as well. So um, it, it's going to be super impactful if uh, they don't keep it uh, exclusive. I I think the biggest thing is is seeing whether or not they are going to barter or or risk the chance of not making the money back. I think the biggest idea for them is 
would they rather get money from just by giving putting on the other console right and just keep continuously make money off of call of duty on sony consoles and then say hey you can get a discount already if you come over to xbox's you know platform and just play game pass if you have pc and don't buy it on the 70 just join pc game pass and just say hey just join up on this service that we have and you can get access to call of duty games every single call of duty game is on game pass now langella kill i know you have the uh you want to talk about your your concept of having it be exclusive yeah i mean again not completely exclusive because they are not going to give up that revenue on other consoles right but having it a month early right it's going to be early access on game pass then after a month they'll go to the pc and playstation right those are the kind of things that if those diehard call of duty guys want to play the game right away once it comes out you know, that is what will entice them to, hey, sign up for Game Pass. You know what I mean? Like, you need to do something. It's not just about keeping the revenue. If you just let it release the same day, right? If you release the same day on all the platforms, you're not really putting the pressure on Sony. You're really not. Like, yeah, you get revenue from them, and you're going to make, again, the split is not the same if it was the third party, right? But the pressure part, you're not going to put on Sony – because those Sony fanatics, the 78%, they'll pay the $70 because that's what they were going to do anyway, right? What are you doing that's going to get people to jump on Game Pass and invest in Game Pass? And that's have some sort of exclusive, exclusive rights to Call of Duty. So I don't think, and when I mention say this, I'm just thinking strategically for Xbox, you play nice until the contract is up. And then when 24 comes around, I don't listen, they can do the bargaining chip for another games to come over to the Xbox that PlayStation released their rights. I don't think it would fly. I mean, if I'm PlayStation, there is no way I'm giving up exclusive rights to Final Fantasy to, to get Call of Duty on the same day. I would rather them just you take it for a couple months, honestly, or God forbid, make a damn FPS. Make a legitimate FPS, you know, invest in Destiny, invest in Go back to Guerrilla War and go into Kill Zone. You know, whatever the whatever you need to do, that's what I think Sony has. I think this is good for gamers. And I know there's going to be the console war crying on both sides where, you know, the Xbox fanboys are claiming we have won the war now because we have Call of Duty Vanguard. And then the, you know, the Sony guy saying, you know, like, you know, called, losing Call of Duty is no big deal, even though we don't have an FPS shooter. So, like, again, I think this is good for gaming because, PlayStation Studios have a collection of probably some of the best developers in gaming, PlayStation Studios. So if they get invested and say, hey, you know what? We need to make an FPS. Let's see what they can do. It might be a failure. It might. But I do think PlayStation Studios has legitimate people who could make games. So can they do an FPS? I think it's a good opportunity. I want, and it's not so much about PlayStation versus Xbox. I just want somebody to compete versus Call of Duty. That's what I want because Call of Duty gotten so fat and Battlefield dropped the ball. And I was a huge Battlefield fan as well as you guys. Mm -hmm. I thought that they were going to surpass Call of Duty and they blew it. And I just want another group to compete with Call of Duty because if Call of Duty has competition, I think it'll be a better Call of Duty. And so that's what I want. Yeah. And, and listen, I think the biggest thing for me and I think I, I what I what I always found interesting was that the whole fanboyism is, is always takes its toll and goes to the whole next level, right? At the oh, end of the day, it, it's just it's obnoxious. It kind of gets obnoxious because you're gonna have obviously the the X, the Xbox fanboys are gonna say, well, if they make it exclusive, then it's auto win for Xbox. Yeah. Now I don't necessarily think that's the case either because I, I don't necessarily think that it automatically just makes yeah. people jump to Xbox. All you have to have other genres. Under wraps because you already kind of dominate the, the shooter genre anyway, right? Call of Duty is the biggest selling shooter game in, in the globe, but it still sucks generally for the most part, right? Vanguard still kind of sucks. So as much and as Xbox, it sells a lot. And Xbox has to fix Call of Duty, right? Yeah, like they, they would have they, to now, fix now that company. They, first of all, they have to fix the company. That's they have what to I'm fix saying. Activision like, and Blizzard as being the, the cesspool that they yeah. are. You have to first fix them to make a good Call of Duty game. And then it, you might hear some things. But at the same time, I'll say for the Sony fanboys of pretending that, yeah, we don't need Call of Duty. We can just make a game. Any, any can just walk up and make a game like Halo Infinite because Halo Infinite sucks. We can make a Halo Infinite. You guys haven't made a, a shooter game in more than 15 years that was landing. So 
let's hold up before we start championing anybody or as BK I'm just saying, doing anything. Right? Call let's of Duty, let's see what the happens. War, if you want to, the war is not over. This Call of Duty is not deciding the war. I'm just going to say that right now. If it, the console war content creators, if you're claiming a victory, right? Like, yeah, there'll be a battle. If you want to talk about battle, yeah, Xbox is going to win this battle of a well-established uh, IP for Call of Duty. But the war, if they're talking about war again, the war is not, I don't think, far from being over because it's not like they obtained Modern Warfare Modern Warfare 1, 2, or 3. You know what I mean? Like, the, the Call of Duty is not where it was back in Black Ops 2, no. Modern Warfare 3. Like, those were different, right? If that was the time, that would be a little different. It's not that right now. Yeah, and, and like, I think you're right. Like, we're not talking about the Call of Duty, Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare that yeah. was on was a Game of the Year candidate. We're not talking yeah. about that Activision, right? We're, we're not talking about Blizzard with Overwatch World one time period or World of Warcraft yeah. Blizzard. Like we're talking about a we're company about that, is, that is that is that is essentially <laughs> broken at its core, yeah. right? And you need to now like revamp the entire higher up. Yep. And now they need to start ramping out games or even taking their support studios to start fixing some of your other games yep. that you have that are uh, there are IPs that are just untouched, right? You have ability. I, I think Xbox set itself up to do very well in the future if they do it the right way. If yeah. you were to fix Activision and Blizzard and put competent people in, in front, and then you take the IPs they own and actually give developers the chance to make them, and I think that you'll do well with that. And if Call of Duty were to only be two companies, like Infantry Ward and Treyarch, that your sole job is to make Call of Duty games, and you make it a two-year cycle where instead of it being every year, you come out with one Call of Duty game, the next year you come out with a DLC expansion, and then that following year you might get a new Call of Duty game like it used to be back when you started getting Modern Warfare, World at War, you know, Modern Warfare 2, Black Ops. Like yeah, those, those gonna, are the years we'll, of when Call of Duty we'll was see what the, the direction. Was I say great. this, I just want to make one last point before I want to give Haki another. The impact is this, in my opinion. PlayStation has legitimate IPs. Legitimate ones. And I think Microsoft, what they have done now over the last couple of years with Bethesda and with Activision, which I believe will go through. I don't think PlayStation is going to win the arguments. I think they're trying to put up as best of a fight as they can. When the act, when the, the purchase goes through, what Xbox has done is they have created now a competitive portfolio to battle the portfolio of PlayStation. And then we're going to see from there because right now, like you just said, the future looks bright for Xbox. They have to land those games, right? So it's going to be, that's what I think the impact is, is Xbox is more competitive. That's what they are. They didn't win the war, but what they are is they're more competitive. And I don't think PlayStation is afraid I think that's such, you know, that's just fanboy talk. It's just, it's just easy thing to say. Yeah, just to be like, they're afraid, they're scared. Like, but they, yeah. they recognize that, hey, you know, Call of Duty is one of our biggest IPs. And now we need to, we need to either buy another IP or we need to make an IP that we can have an FPS. I think Destiny is kind of like a band aid, it's not a solution. But like, you know, it's not a bad band aid. I know a lot of people like it. I'm not a big Destiny guy, but I know there is a lot of people who like Destiny. But, you're gonna. They're gonna have to be. There's gonna have to be more things that Sony has to do now once the purchase goes through to, again, kind of alleviate the pain. Um, and again, this is all speculation. We don't know in 24 what Xbox's plan is, but I can't imagine that they don't have some exclusive rights to Call of Duty. Why you spend billions and billions of dollars just to have it? Hey, you know what? We'll just collect the paycheck. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, Hockey. Anything you want to say more on the impact, man? Uh, no, I mean a, a lot of good points. Um, like you guys said, I mean it's they're they're not uh, acquiring you know 2012 Modern Warfare. They're acquiring something you know a, a little bit uh, a little bit stale. So uh, I'm pretty sure Call of Duty said they were going to be taking a year off anyway, right? In yeah, uh, after after this yeah. coming year, uh -huh. they're going to take basically a year off. Yeah, and I think that honestly this is probably the smartest thing they could do, right? Okay. Take a year off and start to plan out your games a little more and say, what's your future look like? How are you going to go about doing so? And obviously with the acquisition, they're going to, they're, there's going to be some heads rolling, right? In my opinion, I think there's going to be the chopping I block, right? I, I, I would be surprised 
if there was no firings from the higher ups yeah, from Microsoft. Fun, but they need what, what's sad is they need a cleaning house. Now I hope we get that. I don't know if we will get that, but there will be some firings. I don't know. I, well, I, I think what's gonna happen is the people who are probably most involved will get fired and then they're gonna have to like a scare they're gonna scare the rest of them. Like you this ain't the boys club anymore where you guys did whatever you wanted and no one checked you. Right. You're gonna put someone competent in power, someone trusted by Phil Spencer, like obviously, and they're gonna like say, "All right, I'm 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 going right to Phil on everything." Well, that's and so, that's yeah, I mean I, that's generally what I would expect because there's no way that the head of Microsoft, not not Xbox, head of Microsoft, upgraded Phil Spencer's title to being head of Xbox Gaming, like Microsoft, or sorry, head of Microsoft Gaming, not even just head of Xbox, because they're trying to make Microsoft Gaming bigger, like it's like a side portion of the corporation. Because Xbox and grand scheme of Microsoft was like like a tiny was a yeah. was a tiny thing to them, but that's why it means that they looked at X Gaming and saying how big it's growing, and they said, "All right, let's get Phil Spencer to be now the head of Microsoft Gaming, and now he's like the head honcho of yeah, but it's all not these about acquisitions." Power. It's does Phil Spencer believe that they need to clean house? And I, right? it's not I about power. generally it's about, generally based on Phil, what yeah. Do. Jay Benner, now granted, people might hate Phil Spencer, or whatever. For the most part, so far since he stepped in, Xbox has definitely had some a lot more ups than downs, in my opinion. I'm based on what I see so far because of and you said this before, Lenzo Kill. They're more competitive. Last generation, they blew it on the yeah. the opening gate. They blew it. Remember Xbox 360 day one that generation, and then Xbox One, PS4 walk in. They want to make a console that's more about media rather than games. Right, and then they blew it when PS4 started kicking their ass, and now you see the Xbox Series S and X is becoming more competitive, right? And that's kind of the 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 point here is that under Phil Spencer, Xbox has gotten more competitive I, I or, or more positive. matched. I really think it's positive on both sides. I know it's like the 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 war doesn't like hearing that, but like it is. Look at the yeah, amount of resources Microsoft is putting in, and Sony is still like Sony's competing with them, and Microsoft is more competitive. Like this is good. This is what you want. This, this is what you is want good. in gaming. You like, want to see both groups fighting with each other. What I don't want, yeah, and this is what I don't want. And this is why I was, uh, and we didn't go too deep into the acquisition. It's not so much like this is a this is a smart move for Xbox, but I don't want an arms race, right? Because you don't want a monopoly between Sony and Microsoft sucking in all the third parties. And what it does is those kind of indies who need those big companies to elevate them, you know, like they're kind of overshadowed because they're bringing in these empty husks that used to be good, used to be good gaming programs. And like, they're trying to revive them instead of, Hey, you know what? Let's develop internally. Some of these like up and coming guys into something, you know what I mean? That's the only thing I don't like um, about these kind of like arms deals, this, you know, kind of sucking up all the third parties that you can get between the two big boys um that's the only thing that I, I i fear like as a another impact on the side but you know this is creating a more competitive environment and that's good for gamers yeah so all right so let's move on to the next topic we did a lot of discussion on that first one but second topic of the day joseph staten was on a interview a, a developer interview and essentially they asked a, a lot of different questions from all across the board it was a, it was a interview on the tech radar podcast um, basically he was asked about, you know, Halo Infinite, kind of the process, because there was a lot of questions going into whether, you know, how did everything go with the development of Halo Infinite? And there was a lot of the side reports, rumors, like you, you name it. And he was answering, he, he took it right on the chin. He was just answering as best as he possibly can, because remember, Joseph Staten wasn't there since the beginning. He was there really in the last two years of the development of Halo Infinite. And he kind of arrived, thank God he did. Because a lot of things he said was that they had to scale back on a lot of the things in the campaign. Well, many just things in the game itself. But the campaign did have, and there's a quote from him saying that, you know, the team went through a lot of iterations on scope and biome ver variety before I joined. Uh, even after I joined the team, we had to make choices about where to scare, uh, scale back. So they had to cut some things out of the campaign to make sure they met the deadline of release. And, and he also stated... We didn't end up cutting that much ultimately from the open world, but I know from the original designs, there was a pretty significant scaling back of what the team had hoped at one point they would deliver, uh, that they would deliver on. We knew that we needed to truly deliver a quality experience and scope our ambitions to make sure that the stuff that we were going to ship 
were matching also our expectations. Now, he also talked about the fact, and this was very interesting, I actually mentioned this on my uh, on my stream, one of my live streams, that, um, but when he arrived, he kind of, you know, as being the new head of Halo Infinite's, you know, story and, and just game entirely, they were pitching him ideas of things that they had in the game, and one of those ideas was crafting. Uh, basically, in open world games, you have the ability to craft, whether it's clothing, weapons, things like that. And, you know, Joseph Staten basically had to sit down and say, Master Chief does not need to craft anything. He's a super soldier. He's a guy that he needs a gun. He'll kill the enemy, take their gun and use their gun. He doesn't need to go hunt for a deer. He doesn't need to go hunt for an animal and craft like leather clothing out of it or anything. So he had to basically squ squash a lot of those ideas. And he actually said this straight on on the podcast. He said like literally that crafting idea was a thing that they told him and he said no like it was kind of like an interesting because he straight up said like there and it kind of shows you that a lot of people at three for three were like trying to like do other things and you had to bring in an old halo dev to say that's not what halo is right halo is not in uh you know breath of the wild like that sounds great breath of the wild you're crafting stuff that's not halo right as much as you want to make this open world game and i thought it was a great idea to make this open world that's not what Halo crafting is not what Halo is. So I think basically it was kind of a very interesting interview. He kind of went into even a lot of other things. And uh, it, I kind of wanted to get your opinion about whether do you think that this was a surprise that Halo Infinite had to scale back a lot of things like based on what we see. Did, did, did this interview surprise you at all? Hockey, I'll let you go first. Do you think this interview surprised you? No, no, not at all. Um, knowing that the game got, uh, you know, delayed up front, um, and then getting into the game and seeing how, um, you know, small content that it had, uh, they're adding stuff now and everything. But I mean, I love the story. I thought the story was very good. Uh, but am I surprised that they took a few things out? No, I'm not. Um, and we've discussed this before. They definitely could have added more terrain and things like that uh, in the story. But I'm not surprised at all. I just want more content for the entire yeah. i want it as soon as possible i know season three they're supposed to be coming out with some good stuff so i just want content it's a good game the core of it's good it just needs content yeah and so the joke kill i i feel like we've discussed this a hundred times was this surprising that they cut content to meet demand no it was it's pretty obvious when you play the game that you know it's it's like We've talked about it so many times over and over and over again. And then every time they speak in 343, they just give, they kind of just reassure our hypothesis on the game. Um, and it's just, you know, it, it's unfortunate. And they've always been behind and we've talked about it. It just feels like they're always trying to catch up. And when you go to the open world stuff and it just feels like 343, and hopefully that this changes right going forward. 343 feels like they're they're trying to create an identity, a different identity than what the original Halos were. And you saw that at four and you saw that in five and leading up to infinite, it feels like, again, they're trying to create an identity um, instead of using an identity that they've had. And every time you have a game that goes on for a long period of time, you do have to adjust things, right? Like the, there are things that you have to modernize, but like you said, the crafting, that doesn't make sense. Hero shooting, when you mentioned in another round table, that doesn't make sense for Halo, right? If this is Elden Ring, if this is Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, if this is for Horizon Forbidden West, crafting makes sense in their open world. Crafting here doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. And yeah. so, like, I, I, there's just this disconnect between them understanding what Halo is and what Halo, you know, the direction that Halo wants to go. And now you bring in somebody who was an old Halo guy and there's that conflict there, right? So again, he gets the final say, which is good, but you can just tell that 343 just, they can't, they've they had a long struggle with trying to find an identity for Halo. And I'm yeah. hoping that the core gameplay is something that they can continue going forward. I like the campaign. I wish there was more. Um, that identity, I hope they keep going forward, but you can tell every time they speak, we get more and more, you know, look into that. This game probably should have been delayed again. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Like one thing I'll say was that at least that they never landed at what they were claiming to do. Like crafting never made it to the game. 
that hero shooters never made it to the game. Thank God you had some wise words from either Joseph Staden or other people in the company that said, no, that's dumb. Don't do it, right? Thank goodness the morals kicked in and they said, this is a dumb idea. Because if they did release with those things, you probably would have almost everybody that was a Halo fan from the beginning would have jumped ship, right? And I think that that's the thing. And Angelo Kill said this, I said this, Haki said this on a bunch of different videos. The core concepts that they have in this game are exactly what you want to see in a Halo game. It's just about the lack of content and things to do that make this game feel like it's still missing something, right? And one of the things that kind of go along with that interview in his, uh, in his interview as well is he also made the basically stated that they have struggled with live service because most live service games are really one thing, right? They usually focus on one thing and that's it. And he actually, and I said this a long time, I said this actually in our one of, our, I think our third video ever on this channel that said Halo is not meant to be a live service because it includes a story, it includes multiplayer, and, you know, there's a lot of multi aspects of multiplayer that are supposed to be forged, there's a little custom games. There's a bunch of things that go into Halo more than things like Fortnite, things like Apex, and just Warzone. Like Warzone is just like one mode with three variations, and that's it. Fortnite, one game type, four variations. Apex, same thing. And it's a lot harder to be a live service game effectively when you have these a bunch of other things going in. Now, I'll also say from the other perspective, Call of Duty Modern Warfare was a live service game essentially because they had seasons but the difference i think in my opinion is that activision being as massive with putting all these support studios around them as a multi-thousand group studio and he even said you know three for three relatively is not a small company but they have like 500 people working on it but then you compare it to activision and he literally i think he mentioned activision like my like infantry ward has thousands of people working on the game or even, uh, you know, EA has thousands of people working on a respawn. Same thing with Epic Games, right? So it's like he's saying, he's not making complete defenses, but he's also saying we had difficulties because we're not necessarily, like, we weren't set to be a live service game. And I think this concept of being a live service game was thrown late in the game. And that's my hypothesis, was that when they realized the game wasn't going to be done at launch, then you started hearing the, it's a live service. It's going to be made. It's going to be finished at a later date rather than be done at launch. And then they start adding DLCs. It's like it's their excuse or Microsoft's excuse to say this is not a complete uh, a finished game because it's a live service. Because all of a sudden you notice and you guys will definitely chime in on this, too. There's a lot of game companies out there that start changing. Oh, we're a live service because they realize that the game is broken. I'll give you a perfect example. Battlefield 2042. They came out charging a hundred plus dollars for game, and then later at a later date, maybe two months in, they're like, you know what? We're gonna be free to play. We're gonna be a live service game. And I was sitting there like, if you start charging for free, I'm gonna start beating someone's ass because you charge me a hundred plus dollars for early access to a game that's not complete, right? You can't start changing your tune now. And I feel like a lot of game developers or even just big companies themselves are gonna use live service as a crutch to essentially allow people to say well they're not finished because they're a live service game right a lot of a lot of perfect examples and games we even play like Mario strikers that's a live service game there's no characters there's two new characters three months in or two months in because you didn't finish it on time right things like that right but that doesn't give three for three an excuse but i also understand it kind of was things i said like i said this already that a live service games generally are smaller that are just doing certain things and they get updates faster because they're smaller in scale versus bigger games like halo or call of duty it has just a massive scale company that does it but i want to get you guys opinions before we move on to the third big topic of the day so hockey i want to go let you go first here do, do you like do you think that con that like that that comment about you know using the live service they weren't ready for live service or even that they weren't built for live service do you think that that's completely right or do you think that is that a cop out for three for three to say like yeah yeah you're using that as your your excuse that you should have still had this game completed in the time span that you're you're telling us yeah so i mean and like you had said a lot a lot of the games started falling um i think it is it definitely shouldn't have been a live service game they unfortunately you know they should have laid it 
we were waiting a long time for it. It got delayed already. How mad would we have been if we had to wait another year? Uh, would you rather have played the game? You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff, but um, the content just not being there is just such a buzzkill. I mean, the game, again, we, and we've all said it, we're just repeating, I'm just repeating myself. The core game is great. Um, if it's going to be a live service game, we need a lot of content. It's not just one map or just like they haven't even put any new guns in there, but like it's got, if it's going to be live service, which it is, they start, they got to start giving us a ton of content in the next season or two. Yeah. Uh, and I think generally season three is supposed to be their point in time where they start at least ramping out stuff like maps because Forge is supposed to release with season three. And that's going to be the, the, I guess the way for them to use the community to say, Hey, make maps. Right. And you can already see the amount of stuff people made already. And I think they've already given this build to, to, to insiders, like insiders that we didn't even know about. Those are the people that were leaking it like for months ago. So I, am, I, I, based on a lot of reports from insiders are saying they're going to release maps, like a lot of maps with this, with the forge, because they have basically have the ability to make them with forge. But Angelica, I want to give your, get your opinion here, because obviously we've talked about companies using cop-outs of saying, hey, we're a live service. Don't don't be, don't be mad at us. We're live service. Yeah, so. and I'm going to just be fair. And I think, you know, Joseph's uh, state, uh, state is, again, he's, he's not doing a bad job. And, and he's definitely been the best leader that 3 for 3's had uh, yeah. in multiple generations so far. Um, but this was the worst part of his interview. I, I do think it was the kind of the excuse-making portion of uh, why they are where they are. And it's not that he's wrong. Um, because a lot of what he said is not just probably what's going on at three for three, but it was very accurate, um, about live service in general. Um, but it just felt like a cop out. And again, the fans, the halo universe didn't ask you to become a live service game, right? They didn't, they didn't say we want halo to be a live service, right? That was a decision made by three for three and Microsoft. And I, I, I anticipate, um, when Joseph Staten got there, halo was in the, even a worse condition than probably the public thought that was in. Um, and so they probably went to Microsoft and Phil Spencer and said, Hey, you know, we need more time than even what you gave us. And I understand on Microsoft side and say, no, we gave you that time. We're not giving you more time. And so they probably came up group wise, kind of a PR spin is in, okay, we need to say we're live service, uh, because we can't look like we're number one in fighting. And number two, we can't say we delayed this and and say okay the game is not complete so mm -hmm. i think that's what happened and you know that's why they've been put behind the eight ball this entire time and they're not a live service i mean that that's they can keep saying live service but it doesn't mean it and a lot of companies are doing this and this is like an ugly trend that's going on in gaming where if it's not a finished game if it's a game that doesn't have a lot of content just call it a live service and everyone should accept it um, and that's BS. And, you know, as much as I love Halo as a franchise, I can't give them that excuse either. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. I think we almost like can call it. I, I can, uh, Langella, we talked about this many times off, off camera. I think it's verbatim that when they arrived, they, they probably had asked Phil Spencer, yo, can we get another year? Yeah. Joseph Staten was brought on as a consultant, right? He was not brought on to be the head of Halo Infinite at first. Yeah. He was brought in to be a consultant by his friend, uh, Bonnie Ross. Bonnie Ross is the head of 343, three, yep. right? She was friends with him back in the Bungie days, and she said, hey, and he had a whole interview about his whole, like, how did you get, how did you get back at 343? Three three? And he said, Bonnie Ross is a dear friend of mine, right? I was in Seattle area, and she's like, hey, can we get some coffee or whatever? And like, I want to talk, ask a favor. And he's like, okay, I'll hear. Because he was, he was gone by destiny at this point, and he was working as a consultant for smaller companies making games, right? And he basically got brought on and said, hey, can you can you supervise Halo, the new Halo game we're making? And can you at least give some insight about some things that you see? So when he showed up, he saw like, yo, this is like, just a Bonnie, like, this is gross what I'm seeing right now. And he, he's as nice of a guy you can get. He'll be like, yeah, it was all right. Not bad. But I can tell, like, he was like, yo, this is, this is bad. And so when Chris Lee, who was the head of Halo Infinite at the time, probably w had went to Bonnie, like, hey, we're going to need probably another year to finish this thing, you know, or, you know, something of the sort, like at least giving the four, cause I think by that point, by the year away, he was gone, but essentially he went probably said, this is the forecast. It's not going to be ready for this time. She had to go to Phil and be like, 
we're not going to be ready for that November 2021 release. And so he's like, I'll get like, I'll give you that time for that year, but it can't go later. And then when they found out that it's not going well, Chris Lee's head had a role and then they hired Joseph Staten as the next head. And so when they found out that they're going to need another year, possibly they said, that's not going to happen. You're going to have to release this game. Let's just call it live services so that they'll like, the PR won't be as bad, yeah. and, ju- and and that's essentially what basically what I think happened, right? Because yeah. I think Joseph Staten said, "Hey, we need to cut as much crap from this as possible and just make it a Halo game that's a single." And I said this on the round table with Kevin Kulak, Snack Pro, to make this a single, like it's not a home run, not a double, it's a single, it's a safe hey, single, it's a Halo game but that's it, it, safe so but tough. lack of content. Yeah, it's so tough to swallow because you can't separate Joseph Staten now from three four three. Right. Cause like this is three, four, three's third at bat. Right. Mm-hmm. So when you go one for three and it's a single, you know what I mean? Like that's why Halo Universe is kind of getting fed up. And yep. I understand that kind of anger. It's just the hope that, okay, the core gameplay, which is the heart, in my opinion, is the hardest part of a game is finding your identity. It feels like they found the identity now, but now you need to create complete games. Yep. Right. Now it's time to, to rev it up in the Halo Universe. Um, so we'll see if they do it. That's the hope, but I do understand the frustration. I'm frustrated. It's like, damn, we went through Halo 4, which was like, it was okay. Like, you know, like, but then the Halo story 5, was okay. The, the multiplayer wasn't the greatest, was not good. And then Halo you go to 5, 5 yeah. the multiplayer Halo 5, was okay. The, yeah. And the story was hey, awful. Yeah. The, yeah. The Halo, Halo 5 online, relatively, when you look at success wise, yeah. it was, a, it got to the most populated it, it since was. Halo 3. But, like the, the, but the, it was, the it was different. Yeah. Five was, was online, was just so nauseating too. But the online overall did well uh, for that yeah. game. Yeah. But the story was the worst in the, in the franchise. Yep. Right. So, like, yep. they can't, they couldn't find an identity for Halo. Then we get to Infinite, and it's like, okay, this feels more like Halo. But then what? Right? They needed another year to put in content, so we got like in, we got a shell that like you like what you see, but like there's not much in there, and that's the problem where we're at when it comes to three four three. And it's yep. you know you're hoping that Stadium's there for the long haul, and that they finally put in the resources and get a group together. But like that's where the growing frustration goes, and then we're hearing these interviews and three four three, and you're like we're getting in under the hood look at three four three. It's it's honestly it shows you exactly what the issue was. Like we all know by this point, yeah, we everybody knows exactly what happened, right? It just it was an assumption, it was a thought, but he just confirmed it, right? Essentially, what happened. So let's we talk a lot about the first two topics. Let's jump into the final one. This is a big one, right? GTA 6 was announced, but it has a new protagonist, a, a female protagonist, which they haven't had in GTA as the main protagonist ever, right? This this lead protagonist is is, uh, is going to be, uh, you know, I guess part of the Vice City drug trade, right? Which so gives you the idea that's going to be one in Vice City, which a lot of people, Haki kind of called it, he wanted it in Vice City, right? It's going to be in Vice City. Uh, it's going to be a female protagonist. But the other thing that was also reported was that Rockstar came out and said that they're going to be more culturally sensitive, right? And this is a kind of an interesting thing because I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. That's not a bad thing to be culturally sensitive to groups of all of all groups. But they also started talking about how Rockstar was always this mantra of being a boys club, as in they were always a boys club, so it always appeals to the males and never females. So they wanted to kind of now change their tune to become more of a culturally sensitive company. And that also includes going into GTA 6 and making that game as inclusive as possible. And the story will be kind of a Bonnie and Clyde-esque type of story. And, uh, you know, originally they were thinking that there were going to be multiple locations at launch, but that was kind of stuffed. It's going to stay in Vice City at launch. And then as time progresses, they might add more locations because originally thought that it was going to be a mixture between Vice City, uh, a place in North America and South America to kind of make it that like that drug trade um, concept. But... It's not going to have that at launch. It's going to be a mul- multiple things, and they think it's going to come out in two years. So, whoa, two years. Rockstar usually it's going to come out in t- twenty thirty four, but two years that would be very interesting if it does land in that spot. But the big question I want to ask us, and this will probably be our last major topic, would be: Are you concerned that GTA Six will change too much and hurt the overall performance of the game? Right, because obviously the culturally you know, inclusive thing that kind of, it's like, it's weird that they have to come out and say, we're going to be culturally inclusive. It's like, 
it's like they're going to make it an emphasis point like it might change like a lot of the the gta things that were there right and langella can i want to get your opinion here first do you think that the, that rockstar is going to change too much of the gta you know outrageous but simulation of life anything can happen type of game that they've always had i think that's going to change an overall impact the performance of gta 6 yeah that's the concern and to me again we're not here to we're not here much we're not macho gamers any of us no. three like i could care less if it's a female or male protagonist um hell if you want to choose i think that's the best is that's the best one choose choose um, whoever you want it's your it's your it's simulation you yeah. and it's just the female i'm cool with it as long as the female's a badass you know and mm-hmm. and, and fits in that gta environment I'm cool. I'm all game. The only concern I have is when you say we're going to be more culturally sensitive, it's very broad statement. And it kind of lets your mind wander on what could they possibly be taking out of this game? Because the GTA identity is, it's like a real life simulation. And if you want to be, you know, a good guy, you can be a good guy. But if you want to be a bad guy, you could be a bad guy and you could do bad things in the game. It's not a kid's game. Right. And it's, you know, it's a mature game and, you know, there's mature aspects to it. And I hope they don't divvy it away from that too much because that's the identity of GTA. That's what mm-hmm. they are. And so when video games change their identity, it's very dangerous. And, you know, that's something that is a big concern when I hear those kind of talks. I think everyone should evolve over time. Right. But like you can't you got to be careful about potentially changing your identity. And I don't think GTA especially GTA six, which is also very disappointing on what have they been spending all the time on uh, again, all these years um, that, you know, like, again, they're going to be coming out all oh, one city and then we'll add cities later on again, talking about that same type of BS. Live service. You know? yeah, yeah, exactly. And so yep. again, there, there definitely is a concern on my end. Yeah. Hockey. What do you think, man? I know that I, I, <laughs> I try to remember the stories of us having to pretend to play, uh, play, not pretend, but, how to sneak GTA in some way to play it. Oh, what yeah. do you think about that, man? What do you think about this this new, I guess, era of GTA? Do you think it's going to change the performance of this game? Yeah, so, yeah, the story of how I got GTA, that, that's a little bit radar, so I'm not going to say it on stream. You know, you'll probably catch me saying it on Earth. On live stream, probably. Yeah, on live stream, we'll talk about it. probably catch it on Mars the stream. Not on the, not, not on the round table, but um, listen, I get the cultural uh, sensitivity, but GTA six cannot be a safe space. You know, like this is not a game that's like, it's not, you're not shooting paintballs, you know, there's guns, there's knives, there's, you know, you can mod the game and you can get really crazy. Um, like Langella Hill said, you can't change the identity. Um, and GTA five was one of the coolest games. You can literally do anything. You can follow the story uh, for the first like year, year and a half. I didn't even do the story. I just ran around, didn't like the most craziest things, you know, like, I would drive a, a car into an army base, steal a, a jet, and just fly around, just blow stuff up. So it's one of the most game-changing games uh, that's probably ever came out. And to change his identity, like Angelic Hill was bringing up, you can't do that. It'll be such a bust, and there's been a lot of busts this year. So I'm hoping that, you know, in a few years, whenever it does come out, it's good. Female protagonist, totally fine. Don't care about any of that stuff, but definitely do not completely change the identity in the backbone of this game. Yeah, I mean, like, listen, if a female protagonist thing, that's not even the big deal to me. Like, I, I yeah. honestly, I'm surprised that they didn't have a female protagonist to this point anyway. Because, like, there, you can make a badass female character, like, we've seen it with Ellie, we've seen it with Aloy, we've seen it with a bunch of them, right? Like, yeah. You know, like, Laura Croft, we've seen a bunch of female characters that have shown up and kicked people's asses. Like, that's not a problem. The problem that, or rumor that people have that's an issue is the whole culturally sensitive thing that it just is like too large, and, Frank, and Angelico said this, too broad of a statement to just say that without kind of explaining what is it, what do you mean by that? Like, what, what exactly are you saying? Are you going to restrict people's ability to play whatever, do whatever they want? I think that's what the fear is. Like, if you're saying we're going to be culturally sensitive to like different groups of people, that, that's not a problem. It's just more like, are you going to restrict us from playing GTA yeah. anyway? we want to play. And like I said, you know, some of us might be like, I'm just going to like do whatever I want do some wild boy stuff in GTA or just like, just going to play the game. You restricting what people can do in GTA is what's going to make it less of a fun game, right? Every single game that rockstar has made to this point has given you the ability to do whatever the hell you want. Right. 
Like even LA Noir, where you're playing as a cop, you can literally do whatever you want in that game, right? Rockstar as a cow as a cowboy in Red Dead Redemption, do whatever the hell you want in that game, right? Essentially, that's the point. They give like, you a lot what, of freedom. So, yeah, a lot of yeah. freedom to do whatever you want, and whether you could be a good guy, bad guy, whatever, neutral doesn't matter. The whole point is if you, if you don't restrict the way people play, then I don't think it's gonna be a big deal. But if you do restrict it, then you're gonna fall along the lines of like Saints Row, where Saints Row. A lot of people have jumped off that bandwagon. Like Saints Row was a, like a series that was similar to GTA, where you can kind of do whatever you want, and it's a goofy story, like outrageous goofy. But they, the new new Saints Row game, a lot of people were like, "Yo, I I can't play this game because it looked like it just looked didn't look good. It didn't look as good as what the old Saints Row games were. And if you start changing too much about what the core game is like, then essentially you're gonna lose a lot of your fan base, and they'll just keep playing." GTA 5. And unfortunately, Rockstar's lost that vigor that made them the great company that they were. Essentially, what I mean by that is that they've now become fat, right? They become essentially that company that instead of racking out games on a solid pace, they now are taking their damn time on just the basic things like making a remastered trilogy and taking so long to do it. And then it comes out a dumpster fire and they're going to say, no, you're going to pay full price for that. Even though it's buggy, looks like they didn't change barely anything at all. And then you're going to blame the gamer for, for questioning you. Like, you know what I mean? Like those dumb things. And then you're going to say, well, we had planned GTA 5, uh, GTA 4 remaster or GTA. You know, we want to do re, uh, remaster Red Dead 1. You know, we want to do a new trilogy. You're like, you're now just wasting your time. Oh, they and canceled, now they can't. Yeah, they can't. Well, that's my point is that they had to sit there and take it. They had to now be. I, we have to cancel all these projects because we look like crap because our trilogy looked horrible. And now we're going to make a GTA six and they have to now make amends for everything and try to make everyone happy. And if you just made GTA six, like the regular pacing, then we wouldn't have this problem, right? We wouldn't have to like, you have to like backpedal and now have to defend yourself, right? You wouldn't have these issues. Um, let's jump to the last thing this week. I had a video I posted out about one of my first legendary games uh and and this is my it's a my it's my list basically games I found to be legendary but most people kind of agree and that game was Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild um I kind of want to give you guys your your due to let you guys talk about it I had a whole video about this so I might not really give too much of my own opinion cuz go watch the video I'll be located in the description below to go watch it but Legend of Kill you played this you beat this to its entirety uh do you think this is a game's legendary and what do you think is the most important part about the game that makes it that way it is legendary and um i think it's an all-time game um again where we rank numbers is, is always a great debate on where it is but i do think it's among the giants up there um and at the time it came out there's one of the most vast uh, open world games and a very um i give a lot of kudos to nintendo for changing the formula for legend of zelda and still hitting the mark um, because Legend of Zelda, for the most part, outside Majora's Mask, was a very linear game, um, and they created a vast open world. And it's not perfect. It's again the with the weapon breaking and kind of the there's there's scavenging and then there's too much scavenging, and they kind of go on that line of a little bit too much scavenging for weapons and stuff like that. But it's it's charming. It looks very good, especially for Nintendo. Um, you got some voice acting, which you never see in a Legend of Zelda game. The story was solid, and I love the environments. The, the environments changed. Um, and again, it's not the perfect game. Would I wish there was more old-fashioned Legend of Zelda dungeons? Yes. Um, was it, you know, again, getting the weapons breaking. Like, there was good weapons that I had that would break right away, um, which was annoying. But it's one of the legendary games, and I recommend anyone who has uh, an opportunity to play it to definitely play it. And it's inspired, you know, we talk about impact, it's inspired some tremendous open world games like Elden Ring. You see the developers talking about they've taken some ideas from Legend of Zelda, from other open world games, and created great games. I'm not saying they're direct results of it, but you can see that they've in, even inspired some other game developers to make certain open world games. And, you know, those are the kind of games that are legendary when you get an impactful moment like that. Yeah, so Aki, I know you're relatively new to Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, but so far, man... Do you think this game has what it takes to be legendary? Or what do you like about it? Yeah, so um, I'm probably about an hour or two in. We're playing so many games. We're always streaming. So whenever I can pick it up, I do. Um, 
But I mean, listen, I love Elden Ring, and I played Elden Ring first. Now I'm playing this, and it's it's pretty similar. You know, the open world, the bosses in the open world, the lore. You know, it, it, it's it's a similar similar game. It's just cartoon. I mean, I've I've just started to get really get into Nintendo games. You guys have been into Nintendo games like Die Hard for decades, right? So yeah, I'm just starting to really get into to all these these new kind of games and and the way that you play. Like, I always used to be in uh, you know first person shooter. Everyone knows that by now, but um, this game definitely has what it takes. It's very fun, um, and I can see how it would be very addicting, like Elden Ring, but. As Langella Kill was saying to me the other night, <laughs> Elden Ring, you're gonna put a lot more hours in. So this one is a little, definitely a little shorter, but it's it's gonna yeah, be. Yeah, it's like it's a more child down version of yeah. Elden Ring, um, and you know what? That's not a bad thing, right? Because like yeah. some people don't have 200 hours to put into Elden Ring, right? Yeah. I put in over 60 for Legend of Zelda, and I thought that was like the most hours I've ever put in a video game. You know what I mean? So like you know, it, it's it's a very charming game. Um, and I think it's an all timer, one of the all timers. Yeah. yeah, like you, you putting in all, we, and we completed it to its entirety, like sixty yeah. hours on Legend of Zelda. I can't even fathom completing Elden Ring to its entirety. Like, right. I don't know how that's physically possible to like do that with Thousands. the amount of things we have other going on in life. I can't even imagine doing that. Um, but with that being said, guys, that's going to be it for the show today. Please, if you haven't done so yet, hit that thumbs up and subscribe for more future content. Please join us on our social media on both Twitter and on Discord, and that's located in the description below. If you want to support the channel, please, you can join us on our Patreon, as well as just donate to the show. We do appreciate any donations or anyone that joins up on our Patreon. You'll get a shout-out for sure. Um, and you can always catch us on our live streams and go check out our content. A lot of new videos out there. But if anything else, guys, I think we're all settled. This is going to be it for us here at Marsman Gaming. Signing off. Peace out, guys.